<laughs> hey, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me for our first episode of In Conversation with ASI and giving up your time to, um, I guess, share a little bit about your journey and some of the highs, lows and in-betweens. Um, part of this has come about because, as we know, COVID has really, I guess, played a huge part in the creative space and how we're able to move forward with what we do. And, um, I mean, we were just chatting even before I hit record on this about how 12 months ago things looked very different for you and that's definitely something I want to touch on today but for those who don't know you Sarah can you maybe give us a quick snapshot about when you did your course where you're located and um, maybe a little bit about your journey so far yeah absolutely um first of all thank you for having me it's an honor to be involved in this series I think it's a really great idea for all the community to sort of um yeah, hear other people's stories and how other stylists are doing it. So thank you. Very honoured. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know me or haven't seen me in the ASI classroom, I am Sarah Dela Cruz and um, I am a Geelong-based uh, stylist. Um, now, I think I did my course in March of 2019. Correct me if I'm wrong, Claire. I think it was March 2019. Yeah. So it's been probably two years that have been on the styling journey, but definitely was a lifelong dream, probably since I was a little girl, um, to become a stylist, although I probably didn't realise it myself. Um, I think there was a few little hints, like every now and then throughout my life that sort of said, oh, you should be doing this, you should be doing this, but, um, you know, young and dumb and just ignore the signs. Um, but, yeah, so now I find myself two years on in the journey and uh, heading into more of within the music scene, editorial scene, um, and sort of celebrity red carpet styling and stuff as well. So, yeah, it's been a ride for sure. Yeah, I definitely want to hear more about that ride as we yeah. go through the conversation. Absolutely. But um, to give, I guess, this uh, format some structure, one key question that I'm going to be asking all of our stylists is, what is a favourite piece of clothing from your wardrobe, or it could be an outfit, and tell us why you love it. Oh, I have so many. Like, I know that we're all about, um, you know, having really clean and, and constructed wardrobes and mine is anything but that because I just collect so much. Um, God, there's a couple of favourite items. I reckon probably my, roast, my most recent is a vintage Gucci shirt that I found at uh, the Mill Markets up near Ballarat. Um, we were going for dinner and had nothing to wear and I popped in and I found it. It was like 20 bucks or something. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. So maybe that. I don't know. There's so many. Yeah. Um, you know, because I've travelled so much, I've collected all these little pieces from around the world. So there's definitely those items that, um, like I've got this collectible leather jacket from Paris that just takes me instantly to Paris. Um, there's these old school um men's trousers that I got in London which instantly take me back to those uh, memories so yeah wardrobe's definitely full of those things yeah how cool though that you've almost got like a piece of your personal history plus <laughs> those memories that associate with it and I think that sometimes as stylists we forget and I mean as we teach wardrobe editing even here at ASI it's like sentimental reasons oh how do we do that but it's and navigate that with a client but when it's your own like you can sort of see yeah, how we're really yeah. <laughs> so, like captivated by something and the memories that evoke yeah. and even that transportation to yeah where we were that's yeah so cool. yeah so there, yeah there's a few special key items in my wardrobe that just instantly bring those moments of joy I mean I've got this beautiful silk um it's like almost like a nighty or a slip that I instantly saw it and thought one day when I get married I might wear that the next day and it's in I bought it in Turkey and it's still hanging in my wardrobe just waiting for it <laughs> yeah so, um yeah funny would you say you that you're predominantly more of that like vintage sort of unique piece shopper look yeah yeah I think so I've always uh, been an op shopper um, and I reckon probably 60% of my wardrobe is op shopping. And I think I was just so financially thrifty back in the day that I've kind of grown up and never grown out of it. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yeah, definitely. Like I love a good bargain. I would much rather get used and go to the op shop than spend 250 bucks on a piece that I know that, you know, yeah, hasn't been ethically made. Yeah. 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 So cool. I think as well, like when you mentioned that Gucci shirt, it's almost like that one-off find that you know no one else is really going to have, even though it's a designer label that, you know, we see pieces from that designer all the time, but it's like now it's yours and it's special to you. I love that. Yeah. And I have a really lovely thing that I do when I do go out shopping and I do find an amazing little item is I ask the item permission if I'm allowed to have it um, and I'll instantly get a vibe whether it's yay or if it's an A because um, that's obviously got a lot of history. So I always... Yeah, just ask permission or a piece of furniture or anything like that. I'll always ask permission if it belongs with me. <laughs> That's cool. I kind of love that sort of holistic approach to, yeah, like, you know, buying something pre-loved, which is yeah. like, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And then it feels kind of like it chose you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious because, I mean, we all thought when it hit 2021 that things would be different. Um, but still, you know, it's it's August. Melbourne um, is in lockdown again. But where are you currently seeking inspiration? Because there's been lots of highs and lows over the last, you could say, 18 months. Um, yeah. And I'm curious to know, as someone who is so creative, where do you draw that inspiration from? Yeah. And look, I mean, it's it's been really tough on creatives uh, and... Um, you know, mentally, creatively, um, I've really found that this time has given me space to be more creative and for other creatives to really take it next level. Um, so that's really exciting to see. Um, for myself, like inspiration for me, like lately I've just been watching all these fashion shows like Halston, um, Styling Hollywood, which is this new styling series on Netflix, um, and I've just been immersing myself in um, some really cool shows with really cool fashion and just seeing how uh, creative the wardrobe is within them. Um, that's sort of where I've been taking my inspiration from, for sure. Um, I've never been one to follow designers um, or, um, you know, uh, influences to a T I've always been somebody to take inspiration from what's happening around me what's surrounding me culture society everything like that um but yeah I've definitely been immersing myself in tv in tv fashion tv shows yeah been awesome Paulson was amazing Paulson yeah. was amazing love that yeah I think as well like we're so privileged now to be able to access those sorts of um, resources whereas before it would be you know what you saw down the street or what was in a billboard or what was on a red carpet whereas you know we get influenced by so many different things now I love that you say like culture and society and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. I mean you just oh, I <laughs> don't mind that's my little kid, my little kitty cat's tail <laughs> she's being a menace <laughs> the, the joys of like virtual yeah. connection it's like yeah I love it um, yeah I mean I've I don't know if you've watched Glow Up that series on Netflix no I haven't is that the 80s vibe one no Glow Up is where like they're UK based makeup artists and makeup. they get selected some of them have industry like learning and education and experience where others are just like self-taught and they go in for this makeup competition and they're judged by um Dom, I forget his name, but he's got a really cool moustache. And then Belle Garland is also one of the yeah, most Yeah, amazing. Well, but, I've just finished um, Next in Fashion. Yes. Finally. Loved it. It's not coming back for another season. I'm devoted. I'm, I'm really, like, not okay about that. I know. And just to watch how they creatively collaborate together as well is those two ideas and sometimes they're opposing and just, yeah, how they bring something yeah. to life. Um, yeah, and um, you know the backgrounds of like next in fashion, the backgrounds of the selection of who they had was epic. I mean, they had the designer of Fubu, Women's Wear Fubu, yeah. in there, and I was like, wow! Like she was an idol of mine when I was sixteen. You know, not, I not all the Fubu girls through <laughs> with me snack pants, sent me Fubu. Yeah, loved it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just. I mean, what a beautiful place to get inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. And like, 
I've always, and it's something that's always been very innate within me. Um, fashion for me is emotive. It's emotion. Um, I will take inspiration for things that make me feel something. Um, you know, whether it's like going back into 90s nostalgia and I'm listening to an album or, um, you know, if it brings something within me, if it brings out that emotion within me, then, um, yeah, it's inspiring me for sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, tell us what you were doing before styling. Um, so before styling, I mean, I've been in retail and hospo for 20 plus years. So um, directly before styling, I kind of had a retail crisis. <laughs> uh, I was uh, a visual merchandiser. Um at Glue, which I absolutely loved my um, my workplace there. It was so awesome. Um, but I left to go traveling with my partner. And it was kind of like an overnight decision. And I was like, I'm done. If I have to do one more day in retail, I'm going to pull my hair out and had left. And I was like, oh, now what am I going to do? And I was really, really lost. Um, and I remember it was like the first couple of weeks of Thailand. Like we were there for like three, four months. And um, my partner goes to me, he's like, you're looking every day at jobs. You're applying for all these jobs. He's like, just let it go. He's like, just, you know, take this time. You're on holidays. Just chill out. So I did. And then that night I had a dream about um, enrolling in styling school. And that very next day I, um, I started Googling. And it just always kept coming back to Australian Style Institute. And I kind of just went, stuff it, I'm doing it. And I took a leap of faith in myself and signed up. And the rest is history. Wow. It's crazy, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely a calling. And as I said in the beginning, there were definite signs within my life that I should be doing this. I remember when I was living on the Gold Coast, um, I was a styling assistant to the Pack Fair stylist. Um, you know, and she was like, wow, like you, you need to be doing this. But I was moving to London. So it was like, nah, you know, I'm good. Um, yeah, it was definitely something that was always meant to happen for sure. What was London like? Oh, it was the toughest 12 months, but yet the most definitive 12 months of my life. Um my best mate had moved over there and I was living on the Gold Coast at the time. And I just called him and I'm like, do you know what? I'm coming over because I can't do Australia without you in it. So I'm going to go and meet you over there. And wow, like London fashion. I thought I was cool beforehand. <laughs> and then you step <laughs> into London and you're like, nah, babe, settle down. <laughs> settle down. Um, it was so definitive. I mean, you know, I was working at a pub and then, you know, going out to the nightclubs and getting immersed in that London, those London vibes. And, um, yeah, it was very transforming. I think I definitely let go of a lot of inhibitions of myself and really came into my own. Yeah. Um, Fashion-wise especially, you, could, you can try anything over there. Yeah. You can do anything over there. Um, yeah, endless possibilities. I think that's so true. Like I, I did the London thing as well and, yeah. um, you know, did the whole pool beers in a pub and yeah. it, it did feel that way. Like what you just said then about you feel like you can just step into something else because it's like this sense that no one else, there's no one really here who knows me, yeah. I can do whatever, be whoever. It's a great time to explore. Do you think that without that you would maybe have taken a different path coming home? No, look, I think this was always where I was destined to be, for sure. I mean, I was already pretty daring with my fashion. And, you know, as I said, when I got into the London scene, I was like, well, I'm not daring at all. I'm, I'm beige compared to this lot. You know, we'd go to um, some of the gay clubs and, and the fashion that was just being worn. I was just like, wow, like, you guys are amazing. Um, so, look, I think styling was always on the horizon for me, um, but traveling that much. I mean, I did a good three years overseas. Yeah, wow. Definitely gave me insight into um, different cultures and um, different ways and belief systems. And um, I definitely wouldn't be as worldly or as sure within who I am had I not have taken those years to travel for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
That's so cool. Yeah. Do you think that your daringness with fashion, even if compared to London, makes you a better stylist now? Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was like in my teens, like sometimes my mates didn't want to go out with me because what I was wearing. <laughs> I will never forget. I, and I still got this vest. I bought this like oriental watermelon vest from the op shop, right? And I wore it with a little denim mini skirt, um, a Bettina Liano little denim mini, mini skirt. And I came out, my mates were like, you are not wearing that out, Sarah. And I was like, why not? I look fabulous. I'm like, it's hideous. And I was like, I feel good. I love this. Like, I'm absolutely rocking this vibe. Um, so I always had that real belief of um, my choices. And as I said, I dressed myself through emotion. I felt good in it. So I'm going to wear it. So I wasn't afraid to be daring back then. And it's definitely something that I carry through into my styling. I'm not afraid to push the boundary. Um, and to maybe do things that people would think, oh, I'm not sure how that's going to look. But in the end, it, it, it works. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, that training and that development of that eye, that styling eye started when I was really, really young, for sure. I definitely like from seeing some of your work, even across socials, and I know you've had a hmm. couple of shoots published, but the one in Fashion Journal, hmm. um, like your use of layering and texture and like colours and clashing prints, like it just shows. Yeah, that was because it like without sort of understanding the thought process about how something like that comes together, someone might look at that and do you know the scene in Friends where Joey tries on all of the coats, clothes and yeah. stuff like that? You know, there's so many layers going on. And in that situation, you'd think it looks ridiculous. But when you place it in the context of that photo shoot and the way that you manage to bring all of that together, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, who would think that like, you know, a um it's probably a 90s orange black no shape dress could ever go with a beige and navy knitted jumper yeah. with a puffer vest over it and then with a headscarf over it. It's not something that would you normally think, cool, this is a vibe. Yeah. Um, and I always love doing that, just really the unexpected, yeah. doing the unexpected that, that also has an undeniable aesthetic to it. Yeah, definitely. I think you're definitely creating that aesthetic for yourself in the kind of work that you're producing. It comes through. Yeah. And, you know, I keep going back to emotion, but it really is, you know, when I, I was sourcing for that shoot at an op shop and it was just a test shoot originally. Um, and my mate Elaine, the photographer, just called me. was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm shooting my hard. Do you want to style it? And I was like, yeah, cool. It was in two, three days. Just went to the op shop and... When I was sourcing for it, it really was just pulling things out of it, bringing some sort of something out of me. Um, it's nothing tangible. It, it was just cool. That that that's interesting. That's an interesting piece. And then what if I put that with the knitted jumper? Like it really does come through an emotion-based selection. I think. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do in that situation if you're on set and it's just not coming together? How do you snap out of that sort of shit? Yeah, yeah. You, you just got to, like, snap out of it and move on. If it's not working, it's not working. That's something that I learned really early on and I have ASI to think, thank for that. Um, I used to, I, I could, there was a couple of instances where I got really attached to an idea, yeah. really attached to an idea no but it's got to be executed this way and I've got this image in my head and that's how it has to be and it's never going to be that it's never going to be exactly what's in your head so I learned that I had to let things go and now if things don't work you've just got to like move on next what's going to work um I think always at the end of the day you have to hold in mind what's your end result what's your end goal here is your end goal to produce amazing imagery is your end goal to make the product appealing for the consumer? What is your end goal? Focus on that. If it's hitting it, awesome. If it's not, move on. Try something new. Um, and always take in the advice of the creatives around you. Always listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's been some beautiful moments that have occurred on set that is pure collaboration, you know, pure collaboration with 
the geniuses by your side, you know, they're the experts within their field. Um, and if you try and control that or um, dictate how you want it to happen, sometimes that glorious beauty of, you know, instantaneous magic can be lost. Yeah. 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 True. Oh. Yeah. Like, I love the language that you're using. Like, it's really mm -hmm. like, as a creative too, but in a different sort of way, I'm like tingly. I'm like, oh, yeah, she's yeah. speaking language. <laughs> like, yeah, I've just, I've just got a, like so much respect for creatives and, and you know, from designers to the hair and makeup to photographers to stylists, you know, we all are playing in the realm of art and to deny somebody um, their power within their own artistry, I think is a real shame. You've really got to be on be able to honour and champion the people you work with. Um, and I've got such a beautiful um, collaborative um, space around me now because of that. Um, yeah. We all champion one another. Yeah. So cool. Um, I want to chat about sort of, I guess, the side of what we do, which maybe doesn't get talked about a lot, which is sometimes being on your own and being in a creative industry can feel isolating. Yeah. And I know particularly like even last year um, was a tough year for Melbourne-based yeah. creatives in particular, but has there been a moment where you really just thought it's all too hard, I want to throw up, um, throw it all away, not throw up, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you know what I mean? Like that feeling of like it's time to throw the towel and it's not going to happen. And then what was it that actually got you through the other side? Was there like a light at the end of the tunnel and and what got you there? Yeah. Um, look, a couple of instances come to mind. <clears throat> Last year was really tough, obviously, for especially uh, Melbourne and our, you know, our Sydney colleagues are going through it. Um, it was really, really tough. Um, I think when I took the plunge into styling after I'd done my course with ASI, um, you know, the biggest challenge, the big, first biggest challenge that came to me was, um, you know, me pushing up against my limiting belief that um, I can do this and um, the real fear of, of having to dive in. And, you know, your, your ego starts saying all of this, all of these stories, it starts telling you all of these stories of, you know, you're not good enough, you're not meant to be here, you know, you're a fake, you're a fraud, and really allowing that to be there but not giving it the power and going, do you know what, I know this is where I'm meant to be. <coughs> I know this is where I'm meant to be going. And you can sit there, but I'm not going to give you any power and just continually moving forward. So that was really pressing up against my um, belief system. Um, that was the first challenge that I had. <clears throat> and then moving through that, you know, 12 months down the track, I'd gotten my business into a really great place. Um, you know, I had the ability um, to work alongside a, a top stylist within Australia and I'd left my side gig, um, you know, I'd left my uh, restaurant job um, because I was earning an income from this now. Now was a real deal. I was, you know, every week, Monday to Friday, I was doing styling. You know, I'd made it. Uh, and then COVID happened and the job no longer applied. And I created all of this momentum and all of a sudden, boom, it's been taken away. I really struggled at that point. I really, really struggled. And... I called up one of my mentors, Kat John, and she said, wow, listen to how you're putting that. It's been taken away from you. You are giving away your power, like you are out of control. Yes, COVID um, impacts you where you don't have control a lot of certain things, but you still control your life, so you still have the power within you. It, you, you do not resign the power over. And so, you know, I sat in my wallow for a few months. I really did. And I really felt it. And I thought, right, it's enough, it's enough. And I just started with one step at a time, one action at a time. Um, I knew what had changed, not had been lost, not had been taken away from me. I knew what had changed, I knew where I wanted to be. And then I just did one thing every day. 
just one thing, whether that was, you know, what's my new logo going to be? I kind of rebranded. I really thought about where it is, what space do I want to be in, and then just took one action every day to get there. And one action every day turns into consistency and consistency turns into manifestation and progress. And, you know, before you know it, 12 months later, I've now been picked up by an agency. I'm working with musicians and artists, which is exactly where I wanted to be. Um, and I am in a different space, but a totally better and even more so inspiring space than could have ever been happened if I had stayed where I was. So even though these changes came my way and I felt really powerless, um, it was always where it was meant to go anyway, the trajectory that I needed to head in. But had I not have taken that one step every day, mm. um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't be here. Um, so for those students that are feeling really lost and really um, unmotivated and, and sad and deflated, I feel you. I feel you. You're not alone. And there is a way. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And if I can say anything, it's just one thing at a time, one step at a time. I mean, it's so easy for us to get caught up in the how. How do I get to this point? How do I get to the end point of my career? How, how, how? Um, and when you focus on the how, you don't let magic happen. Um, whereas if you focus on the end result, where is it that I want to be? And then just take one step a day, you'll get there. Yeah, so true. Do you remember what that first step was? <clears throat> Oh, good if you don't. I just thought I'd ask in case. I think it was as simple as I think I just did a rebrand because I wasn't feeling my logo. And and I remember having a conversation with Lauren about this actually. I was, you know, the first 12 months, I was really figuring out where I was in in the industry, what I wanted to be. Did I want to be polished? But you know, polished isn't really me. Like I'm 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 raw and I'm authentic. Um and even just something as simple on my Instagram, it was kind of all over the shop. There wasn't really any direction. So I really went back to myself and thought, all right, what, what is it that I want to express now? Um, and it was always my creativeness and, and what that looks like. Yeah. So I rebranded and I just deleted everything on my Instagram and I just started with a social media plan and just used it as a portfolio I think the next day I created my email signature again. And I just started from scratch. Yeah. 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 I think sometimes, you know, and what I do actually chat to quite a few of our stylists about is, you know, they get to a certain point and they're like, I feel like I can't push any further. Like I've hit that top level. It's like, we can, sure. but sometimes you need to actually take it back three steps to take another 10 forward and, yeah. you know I've done the rebrand thing as well so I know exactly yeah. what you mean and and there does come a time when you're when where you thought you were going to be and where you actually want to be sort of divide it's almost yeah. like that fork in the road and you're like do I keep going straight or do I actually take one of these other like yeah. pathways that sort of sprout it out and just you know Absolutely. Throw caution. it's not throwing caution to the wind so much but it's like you've got to take risk to get the reward sometimes risk it to yeah get the absolutely and like you know I think, as I said in the beginning, I was just trying to be too much, a personal stylist, this and that. I was trying to do videos. I was trying to do this. I was trying to... And it just, by the end of that year, I mean, things had been taken away. It didn't, it no longer felt authentic to me. And if anything, I came in with the point of being, having integrity and doing things authentically. I'm not here to be anybody else. I'm here to be me because I know that that's enough. So, you know, at the end of that 12 months, I really had to think about, well, what is it that I want to, yes, what does my brand look like? But I've tried to explore that. And now let's just really simplify it. Simplify it to what does that look like for me? And for me, it was really, really simple. I wanted to be um, in the editorial, in the music, in the campaign industry. And I needed to reflect that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Who's your biggest supporter? Um, 
there's a couple. I mean, I would not have been able to do this without my partner. He um, he works away. Uh, so I fly solo a lot of the time at home. And he saw me through the period before styling when I was lost and how unfulfilling um, my life was. Um, he saw me struggle after that first year. He really has been the rock for me throughout all of it. You know, there was a period where I didn't work for 12 months and, you know, we're really fortunate that um, he does work away and he could support me in my dream and he has done so for the past, you know, two years. He's just fully backed me and gone, babe, you do you. I know, I can see, I can see what's happening here. I can see this amazing epic journey and career forming for you I've got you which was just yeah it's really really lovely to have somebody that supports you and believes in you just as much as you do yourself yeah I suppose it would have been particularly poignant in in those early days where you did have that limiting belief which sort of kept reaffirming to you that maybe this isn't for you yeah, and it's funny because I always knew, like I always knew, but it's your little ego that niggles in and is like, <laughs> they're going to find out you're a fraud, babe. So like, what are you doing <laughs> doing this? Like, absolutely not. And then you just keep going like, no, like I, I'm very aware that this is a space I'm meant to be in. Um, and thank you, but that's, you know, my limiting belief trying to protect me from the world, but you're not needed. Thanks, mate. But onwards I move. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's been a really, really great support. And then I must admit, um, Bianca definitely was integral to getting me out of my funk. Yeah. Um, you know, there's something so beautiful about the ASI community and um, it really does, we do really do support one another. Um, and it is such a beautiful community to rely on when you're not feeling great. Um, and Bianca definitely noticed that I'd been, I'd gone quiet and that I was really struggling. And um, she called me and she said, babe, you're coming on this um, TFP with me. Just come. Just come. You don't need to do anything. Just come. I just want you there. And it reignited in me that I've got this. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. I know you guys have a really beautiful, like, collaborative relationship when you're on set yeah. together. Is yeah. that sort of a favorite moment that you can remember for you two on a set <laughs> um every set <laughs> we're really great I think I look I come into everything going if we're not having fun then what are we doing and Bianca's very similar so when we're on set together it's just um anybody who's having a bad day is no longer having a bad day um I think one probably one of the funniest moments is she's going to hate me for saying this, but she always walks around with a bloody boom box and the worst songs blaring that's going down like CBD Melbourne. I'm like, oh, babe, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Can you not? Um, but it's always a treat. And then, you know, even if it's not Friday, we'll always put on this one song and have a boogie. And yeah, there's good times. Very good times with oh. absolute dogs. Yeah. Absolute I remember dogs. she actually shared a story with me once, which was um you guys were on a set together and you and she was really struggling to get one at particular look together. And she was sort of in that mindset of she's so set in how it should have been based on what the idea that she had in her head. And um she asked for your input and literally in the matter of like two minutes you'd solved the problem and the model was on set and the image was better than you could have imagined. So it's even just that insight that you both have to respect each other's like creativity point of view and and not be afraid to say actually my idea right now isn't the right one can you support yeah absolutely and I think that has a lot to do with um you know we're we're all in the in the ASI community we're all in the same space we're all in the styling industry but it doesn't mean that there's not space for all of us and I think that really comes with that there's, it's not about competition. It's about mutual respect and, and honouring, um, you know, the artistry that the person beside you has that you might not. 
um, you know, Bianca has a beautiful way of, um, of really honing in on consumerism and uh, making the looks really relatable to the consumer. And um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit more eccentric and loud. And I think that combination of, uh, you know, I take on, uh, you know, her gifts and she takes on my gifts in a way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really championing, championing your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, one last question for you, because you do have this incredible opportunity now working <laughs> with an agency. And yeah, I do, yeah. Very good space. <laughs> and I know you and I have even had like conversations around where you wanted to be and that music space, you've always come back to that. But now that you're sort of, you know, forging that path forward, what does success look like to you in the future? And how do you measure success? Because it does look different to everyone, but I'm curious as to what it is for you yeah. that metric that goes, yep, this is yep. where it needs to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have an infinite trust in the universe. I really have an infinite trust in um, it will place me where I need to be. Um, and success for me is really just me being the highest version of myself that I possibly can. Um, nothing even uh, that does come into the world of styling, but it's not defined by that. Um, success for me is being happy and at peace and grounded and styling makes me happy. I'll never forget. I um, It was my creative course and it was our first day of shooting and um, it was a denim shoot. And I just stood back and Javelle came up to me. She's like, you okay? I was like, if I can do this for the rest of my life, I'm a happy person. Um, and I just knew that it was something within me that I just needed to continue doing. So I think moving into this space, it's always just about being of service to my clients, being of service to myself, and being the best version that I can be within this world. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I love what you said there about being grounded as well, because I think so many of us can feel particularly right now um, where, you know, most of the East Coast is in lockdown, that the yeah. rug's been pulled out from underneath them and there's no steady ground left. But I think that really has to come internally, that sense of groundedness, because you have, and like you shared earlier, it's like you have the choice to actually determine how you interpret what's going on and your course of action forward. Um, yeah. You know, you mentioned that you were no longer going to give your power away to what was going on externally, yeah. having to own actually you can take back control and there's ways to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, even though things have changed within the scope of how we do things, um, you know, we can still be super successful. And as I said, it's just one one action at a day, um, one, you know, I mean, I work a lot with my intuition. So I always ask myself, I ask my heart space and I'm like, what do I need to do today to get me here? What is it that best serves me today for me to do? And the always answer always comes through. And as long as I follow that, I know I'm on the right path. Yeah. For sure. But it's really exciting times being with this new job. And yeah, I'm so excited for the future. It looks really, really promising. And um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be good. Yeah, be good. I think so. And I cannot wait to see <clears throat> what it holds. I know that um, you shared with us an email, which was like listing literally like <laughs> thing after thing after thing that has sort of been like ticked off and the yays and successes. And um, yeah. Lauren actually shared it with the entire office and the like literally the content of the email was just like wow in capital letters yeah so i mean yeah. congratulations on you. everything you. that you've achieved um i cannot wait to see what comes next and um yeah yeah i trust that you know for for anyone who watches this they'll they'll really resonate with some of the key messages and um be really excited for you as well so yeah thank you your time this is great oh, thank you guys that was fun yeah. And, you know, just anybody out there that's just um, feeling the slump, you're not alone. Like, I'm in my Ugg boots. I might have a silk shirt on, guys, but I'm in my Ugg boots. <laughs> <laughs> She's in her Uggies. But, yeah, like, never feel um, that you can't reach out. I mean, you know, Claire, you're so amazing at really supporting the students. ASI, you know, as a whole, the community is just so supportive. 
you don't have to go through alone if you are slumping and um we're all here to support one another so yeah just reach out yeah reach out for sure very generous of you thank you so much sarah